everyone and welcome back to my channel. Um, in today's video, um, I'm, I'm, first, in it, I'm first of all going to be doing a book review of a book that I've read recently called Irrational Man. That's the first video. And then in the second video, I'm going to briefly um, tell you about some uh, recipes I have been trying out lately. So first of all, um, for the book review. So I'm just going to get the book. Here it is. So here's the book I've been reading lately. You can see it. It's called it was called Irrational Man by William Barrett, um, and it's um, all about uh, the sort of history of philosophical ideas, um, covering all of the key philosophers. Um, so I'm just going to talk to you now about um, well, a sort of um, how can I say. A uh, sort of synopsis, I guess, of the book. Okay, so here goes. The book, Irrational Man, by William Barrett, um, is, a, is I would say, is a critique of Enlightenment progress. Uh, it was written under the shadow of a hydrogen bomb uh, in 1958 during the Cold War. The book argues... Um, that we need to get back to the Greek conception of philosophy as a concrete way of life, as opposed to merely an academic discipline. Two of the philosophers the book covers, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, um, were not academic philosophers. Their central subject is the unique experience of the individual, as opposed to a homogenous generalised system that ignores difference. Barrett argues for a philosophy that is rooted in actual experience, not abstractions. Um, so to, to get to the root of existence, to get to actual concrete experience, um, could in a way help to um, bring back the human factor to uh, philosophy and by doing so to make philosophy less remote and less um, theoretical, by bringing to the fore um, human existence with all its pain, its suffering, its joys, its sorrows, the whole complexity of human existence and by doing that maybe um, we can really um, get to the crux of what is actually important, what is meaningful in our lives and that might help to, um, you know, in, in the context of course of the Cold War and of the atomic bomb, um, and some of those same concerns, of course, that were overshadowing society back in the 1950s, we're now dealing with in our modern world, um, we need to start looking at what does it mean to be human and what's important. And do we really want to get to the point where we annihilate ourselves? So the book is essentially a critique of the Enlightenment. That it, and the Enlightenment ignored the negative side of human existence simplifying our lived reality and pushing a dark side into the realm of the unconscious because the Enlightenment was all about positivity, progress, moving forward, ever ever more advancing forward, you know, taking great strides with machines and technology. Um, but, but by doing so, of course, it repressed um, maybe some of our more animal instincts and more sort of um, the darker side of our natures. But you can't get rid of the darker side of the natures, so you can only repress them deep into the unconscious. And um, as Freud, I used to be really interested when I, I actually went through a phase of actually being quite obsessed with psychoanalysis. So I read quite a lot about Freud and stuff. And I did remember reading um, Civilization and its Discontents. Well, I think in that book, Freud argued that, the psychoanalyst Freud argued that um, by pushing, you know, by not facing up to our animal instincts, but by denying them and repressing them they can end up coming out later, um, you know, in a big eruption, a bit like a sort of pressure cooker, because he argued um, back in the First World War, a lot of that was to do with um, repressed, um, the, repress, the repression of um, our, our desires and, and instincts and things like that. I mean, obviously that's controversial, and, and you know, I, I don't think it's as simple as all that, but it's, it's this sort of interesting idea that, you know, we have to face up to what's dark within our nature and not ignore it and shove it under the carpet, pretending it doesn't exist, because that will only lead to problems later on. Problems down the road, as we cannot banish the negative. The book mentions Carl Jaspers, who had written a book called Man in the Modern Age, which I might read at some point. 
This book, uh, this book attacked the depersonalising forces within society and calls for a philosophy that emphasises individual authenticity as opposed to a standardised abstract society. This society leads to a sense of homelessness, alienation. We become a stranger to nature and the gigantic bureaucracy. Also, we experience alienation from our own self as society requires only that we perform a particular role, which we then become overly identified with, meaning our whole self is not allowed full expression, so we become cogs in a machine. There is an interesting analysis of modern art in the book. This art portrays the world as unintelligible, without logic. Conversely, the old fiction, for example, had a clear beginning, middle and end. And art, paintings, had a clear um, foreground, middle ground and background, as it arose in a culture in which the universe too was believed to be an ordered structure. This Enlightenment ideology no longer holds water when real existence is examined, with all its loose ends and imperfection. And um, this book here, um, the book I'm talking about, the book... Uh, the Irrational Man. Um, it contains um, a brief analysis of some works of fiction that are kind of critiquing um, intentionally or, or not um, these Enlightenment values. For example, The Novel, The Sound and the Fury by Faulkner is briefly explored in this context. The title of the book is derived from Shakespeare, Life is told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. This world is completely irrational and meaningless, and it's a world where the eternal, with all its essential laws, no longer exists. Modern literature has no beginning, middle and end, as I just mentioned, um, and uh, modern art, the book argues, appears closer to that produced by the East, but the philosophy of the East has historically baffled the Westerner, who sees it as unintelligible. And this is because the Westerner demands a logic or a meaning that the East does not. The East, the book argues, has historically been more in touch with concrete nature, which is naturally meaningless as it goes on without beginning, middle or end. Oh God. Sorry, I'm gonna to have to put my hands in my ears because it's really annoying noise. Okay, concentrate. Can't concentrate when there's noise. It's really, really distracting. These demarcations um, historically be more in touch with concrete nature, which is naturally meaningless as it goes on without beginning, middle or end. These demarcations are human constructions that are not actually in the universe itself. The same as dualities. Since the Greeks, we believe that everything is intelligible, but this is no longer accepted. Likewise, we can no longer hold on to eternal, preordained values. In modern art, large and small objects are treated as of equal value, for example. So Cezanne paints apples just as passionately as he paints mountains. The Western mind has always been hierarchical, with the cosmos being ordered from high to low, a duality between sublime and banal. But hierarchy has now been questioned. The cubists took a, subje took a subject, ordinary objects, tables, etc. And um, for hierarchy, you know, uh, sort of moving up from um, uh, banal to sublime was held up no more as... Uh, was held up... Sorry, I'm really struggling to concentrate today. Bear with me. That noise. God. Um... Yeah, it's held up no more as convention, no more than convention, held up as a construction. Um, also, um, this critique of the Enlightenment undermines the traditional idea of beauty um, as well. Beauty and perfection, the traditional ideas. But in the East, uh, by convert... <sighs> sorry, I'm really struggling. I was just trying to think, sorry, bear with me, I hope this is making sense. In the East, by comparison, there's no duality. A grain of sand is equal, is the equal of a universe. The great progress myth was first formed by the Greeks, and particularly in Plato's allegory of the cave. We sit in darkness of the cave, backs to light, able to see only shadows of objects. The prisoner becomes free, sees real objects and light that cast shadows. So this idea of a progress from darkness to light, ignorance to knowledge. And um, the book argues that this is partly because Plato was terrified by death, and so he took refuge in the eternal, so he did not have to face the tick-tick of time. Plato saw the universal as the only real constant. Particulars are absorbed into the absolute, so humanity is more real than the individual, that is real only insofar as he or she participates in the totality of humanity. And um, again, um, but, uh, and then the book argues how, or showcases how um, 
Kierkegaard and Nietzsche were the first main philosophers to reverse the scale of values and to put the individual in the light, um, uh, the individual as exception to the universal norm, in particular taking precedence over universal, which really resonated with me because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I, I, I'm very much an individualist, um, you know, a, um, at heart really. Um, and um, so that's the complete converse of Plato, who saw ex who who saw existence and particulars as only a shadowy copy of the universal essence, get as timeless and infinite. But of course, Western philosophy is greatly influenced by Plato, and that's where the Enlightenment took a lot of its values from. <clears throat> There's a particularly interesting chapter in the book called "The Flight from Laputa." Laputa is a fictional island in Swift's Gulliver's Travels. Um, let me know if you've read that; it'd be interesting to know. The tribe that lives on the island literally have their head in the clouds and represent pure abstract reason. Their eyes do not focus on the person before them. One eye is turned upwards and another is turned inwards. And they can't converse or socialise properly. And their food is cut into geometrical shapes. Hmm. I wonder if they were autistic. Interesting. Very terrible. Could that be an autistic tribe? <laughs> I wonder. Um, the flight for Laputa is all about how uh, later philosophers can... Um, sort of revolted against this very pure abstract reason that was a guiding force of the Enlightenment, that sort of Laputa um, kind of detached philosophy. The book then goes on to analyse how various groups and individuals sort to turn away from pure reason and get back in touch with messy reality. I also particularly enjoyed the chapter on Kierkegaard. I'm interested in this distinction between aesthetic, ethical and religious realms of being. For example, the child is an eight feet, as so a child lives solely in the pleasure and pain of a moment, but they're thrown into despair if they can't access a pleasurable moment. Ace feats stake their whole life on pleasurable moments. In that sense, I think I'm an ace feat, which might be part of the reason why I'm often thrown into despair. The religious is the highest plane, and this is where the uniqueness of the individual comes into full fruition. The individual might have to break with accepted codes in order to become true to themselves, and this resonated with me as I hope to become more authentic. The book explores the constant presence of death. We may die at any moment, and so death is a constant possibility as opposed to a far-off abstraction. And this is very important in the context, you know, of um, total annihilation with regards to war and the atomic bomb, which is very, very scary. And as I say, this is, this is relevant today, not just back in the 1950s, so it's very scary. In death, we are at our most alone, as no one else can die for us, and so it is a terrifying part of our existence, and one that we all too often deny. But death can also force us to become more authentic and free, as we are forced to confront our isolation for the homogenising and soul-destroying bureaucracy that is standardised life. Our ultimate freedom is to say no, to negate the actual, by drawing up other possibilities beyond the purely observable. By doubting, we can set ourselves against the general, or against the system. I think this is very empowering, particularly for minority groups in society. Sorry about um, me having my fingers in my ears. I'm, I was really distracted by um, some noise coming outside and it's really, I can't concentrate. So sorry about that. I've taken them out of my ears now a bit. This is my life, by the way. Often I need my fingers in my ears. It's very annoying. But anyway, so um, I hope um, that gave you, gave you some insight into this book, William Barrett's The Irrational Man. And um, may well, if I don't know, encourage some of you to have a read of it, um, if you haven't already. It was an interesting read. It's quite, um, I mean, obviously this is quite hardcore philosophy, but it did, I think, bring to the light some of the main issues. And I'm very, very interested in philosophy. Other than food and cooking, it's one of my major areas of interest. So um, I do read a lot about this area. Um, so yes, so um, that thus concludes my book review for today. And I'm now going to be moving on to video number... But two now, where I'm going to do a brief, a shorter video than this one, where I'm just going to be talking about some of the recipes I've tried lately. So thank you for watching.